Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Okay. Hello, everyone. Whoa. I bet you hear this like a lot during the day, but this is like an insane venue <laughs> to be talking. So I will try to make uh, pay respect to the beauty of this thing. Uh, thank you for, so much for coming today. I'm super glad to be able to talk about a topic that it has been uh, in my head, and not only my head, but the head of, uh, I know, a much broader amount of designers uh, in this time, which is just embracing change, right? And what does it mean to design experiences in times of uncertainty? Um, I mean, it's the always the, this is who I am. I'm Fernanda, and as you were told, I work as product strategy and experience design uh, direction. I'm normally really uh, focused into uh, anything that is web or app related. Um, Mexican, born and raised, um, um, recently based in New York City, beautiful city, definitely. Uh, my pronouns, which I think are important, and I'm group experience director at Media Monks, where I'm going to talk a bit more in a minute. And I'm really, really nice to meet you. You can also see that this is definitely my favorite <laughs> sweater. That's awkward. Um, so I work at Media Monks, and the reason why I'm saying that so much is because the content of this presentation really comes of talking with so many disciplines and so many amazing, talented people, and I really want to convey these conversations to you today. So quick uh, snapshot of who we are and what we do. If this actually goes or not. Oh, here it goes. Well, that's sad, because it's a really nice reel. <laughs> OK, let's try again. Well, I guess I will just go for it. We did it, we make it to the end, so I'm super happy for that. Um, thank you, that's an homage of all the people that do some amazing things uh, every day and that I have the fortune to work with. And the reason apart, because I just love to show what we do, uh, the reason why I put this is to put us as well into the context of when I'm talking about design, I'm talking about design in the context, context of digital products and experiences, but I do believe that a lot of this topic might be also relatable to other type of designers out here. I would love to know after the presentation as well. So back to the topic. Uh, the big statement for me is to know that the world is changing, and I know we all know that, and it has been this, this conversation that, I, as I said, just keep coming and coming. So just to try to understand how the world is changing and that, what does that mean for design, 
I wanted to really like look into different angles uh, of what I will say is the problem, right? Like what are the macroeconomics, what is the political landscape, how the cultural landscape as well impact us, the technological acceleration and of course the post-pandemic behaviors. Um, and the reality is that when you translate those and you see the, through those lenses, the impact is very tactical actually. Uh, changes in behaviors, for example, in macroeconomics, these, uh, these economic downturns are leading into way more price sensitive, sensitive consumers, which is also impacting the, the way that the business models are think of. And of course, that when you translate that into e-commerce and into digital products uh, has a great like, a direct impact as well. Uh, we're looking uh, way more into, for example, in a political landscape, how the data privacy laws are more and more important, which is something that I'm very glad of. But as designers, we need to adapt way more uh, and to be more thinking about less about compliance and more around how do we embed these policies into our thinking. So these are just some examples, very worthy, but some examples. Um, the healthcare, the importance of healthcare right now, you know, like how um, not just the industry and the growth that they have from a business perspective, but also how important it is now uh, to look at all the interesting uh, startups and, and biotech companies that are being created since pandemic. I think that is something, something really interesting because they start merging the world of UX and UI also with the world of, of the, the body and the medicine. So I think there are interesting appliances there that are going, we are going to start seeing more and more. The cultural landscape is also impacting greatly, uh, especially, as I said, some pri uh, the laws about privacy, uh, also like the supply chain. You will, we will never start thinking, right? Like whenever something happening in the other side of the world and there are supply chain issues and you're like, as a UXer, what does that mean for me? And then you have <laughs> your client like calling at you, telling you that you have to add 20 more disclaimers into the e-commerce uh, checkout page, you're starting to see how correlated these things are. So this is just for us to give us a bit of a context of when I say that we are in a, in a world of constant change, I really mean it. <laughs> There's so many things that we need to take in consideration. From a technical acceleration, which of course I think we have been talking a lot, actually the, the, the KIC program is really embedded into this, is the massification and adoption of technology like AI in every single aspect of design, of course, is going to change everything, every foundation of what design means and is for us. Also, there are other uh, changes that are going to be interesting to have a look at. We will be, example, the changes in the platform policies, you know, like the Apple Store are changing a bit the way that the, the this, um, yeah, just like the baseline of what their policies were, and we need to be aware of whenever we're uploading an app, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Post-pandemic behavior, it's really interesting how, you know, tech that was used to uh, attach and approach the, the situation are going to just stay with us uh, in this, like, new, new normality. The adoption of technology like touchless, contactless, IoT is here to stay and we're going to continue seeing more and more emerge between what we call digital and what we call physical design. Of course, there's a lot of more and this is interesting like hardware, software, even furniture adaptation for this hybrid work because it's not only about the products that we do, it's also like who, ha, what is our life as a designers, right? So we're also adapting to a way that is not remote now and now it's just like kind of a hybrid thing. So I want to take into acknowledge and acknowledge that as well. Another and last uh, to close this piece is this demanding of sustainable packaging and sustainable is translating also into the digital space. So we see more and more uh, companies that are looking uh, and even uh, entrepreneurs are looking to have, a, to have and understand what sustainability means uh, for digital design. Like, because we see it in the screen, we sometimes don't understand the impact that that have into the, let's call it uh, real world. So how can we actually design relevant experience with all of that buzzing in our heads, right? With all of those considerations. 
for me, and I don't know if for, for you as well, it was really overwhelming to a point. I was like, what do I look at? Do I look at, do I learn AI, but do I just go and understand what is the latest compliance with accessibility? So uh, actually a friend who was taking, uh, a colleague that is taking a management, um, I don't know what it's called, but like a course, uh, she talked to me about this framework, uh, which is the, the Buca framework, where actually this is being used by ma this is being used by management to management people to uh, identify different situations uh, that are complex, that are volatile, that are ambiguous, and that are uncertain, and they try to identify strategies that could allow them to start solving things because you can understand having all the problems, but then you say like, how do I start and start finding a solution? What I did for this presentation and for you guys and for my <laughs> peace of mind was to try to identify some of the things that either I have been speaking with other people about that we are implementing at Media Monks or we are just like making hypotheses around uh, of how can we start uh, embracing complexity, volatility, ambiguity, and uncertainty in the design landscape and in design uh, space in our everyday work, but also in the way that we service and provide um, yeah, that service, that design service for our clients and for the people that are going to use those, those experiences and those products. I'm going to deep dive into these nine uh, strategies, if we wanted to call it that way. <laughs> Whenever I was reading them again, I was like, yeah, Captain Obvious, right? Like simplify complexity, that sounds, but what does that even mean? So I'm trying to get into the detail of all those. But again, I really want this, this talk to be a conversation opener. I would love to get to know what are you, your thoughts are, uh, how are you embracing complexity? Because I think this, we need to tap in this collective intelligence to, to actually find solutions. Anyway, let's uh, get a go. Uh, one of the ways that we are shaping specifically the UX uh, discipline is embracing a systemic thinking. And this means that instead of we normally get to like focus so much into what, who are the users of a specific product, how do they behave within the product, but we kind of feel like everything that is outside that product is not really our problem, <laughs> let's say. Like the ecosystem runs by other team in another part and like we're just looking at the product that we have at hand. And that makes sense because we're putting all of our effort into solving and, and creating the best uh, creative and, and design solution and technical solution for that specific product. But it's so important that we stop looking so narrow into just that, and we start taking in consideration all the things that happen around. If you're using an app, in which con context are you actually using that? Um, how do you feel? Like, if, I don't know, with everything that is happening in the world, if a person is actually not really <laughs> into, just, you know, like looking probably some like funny thing on, on Tuesday, because, you know, like, like a big uh, news break, break up. So, uh, this is something that even if it doesn't feel relatable, is way more, more relatable. I'm putting some of the faces in this case. She's a Stephanie. Uh, she's a really advocating for systemic thinking. She has a lot of talks, teaching a lot of uh, universities around Europe, and I'm happy to say she's my friend, and she has a really good knowledge about it. So if you're interested into this topic, I really suggest uh, just deep dive more into that. So systemic thinking is a really, really important one. The other one is simplifying complexity into bite-sized chunks. And this as an uh, experienced designer that almost like move into service design, CX design, is something that whenever we are with our clients, which goes around very different industries with their very different pr problems, we tend to see that the big issue that they have is that they are so overwhelmed. So if we come overwhelmed and they are overwhelmed, we're just like overwhelming ourselves. Uh, so what we do in that case, the way that we are approaching this is to have a more like a consultancy mindset when we come to them, we try to understand what the big issue is and the, and the issue that the company think they have, what is the issues that they think the consumers have, and then we start to identify elements across that. We start asking questions around if they think they are not selling enough, we try to understand not only like 
let's just like make a push into selling, but try to understand if there are like bad reviews out there. We try to talk to people. We try to understand if the data is even correct, because we have seen so many clients, uh, in this case companies from very different industries, as I said, that are taking decisions over data that is not clean and that is not uh, reliable. So we are getting into the weeds of breaking down the problem in small chunks. We're putting experts into one of those chunks and we are coming back with insights in order as a collective to make decisions. And this has been, sounds super obvious, but I promise has been life changing, at least for me, in the way that we can um, identify and, and find solutions and roadmaps better. One of the things that we're doing a lot more is to getting uh, more comfortable as designers of doing business cases because the reason when you're in front of a, of a person and a stakeholder within a company that is going to decide where your design is going or how the design is going to be approved, uh, it's not necessarily the users, that the ones that are going to give a go, right? It's people that are speaking business. So uh, if you want to sit at the table and be considering in that same level, then you have to speak that same language. So we are embracing more and more. We said now that for, for strategies, for experienced designers, business cases are our new best friends. Everything that we want to make, we try to pull back something simple, something not, you know, like that is going to take you weeks to do, but definitely something that explain why the initiative that you have makes sense for a business perspective connected to what does that mean from a, a user experience perspective. So it is an interesting dance of becoming yeah, a bit more consultative in a way. Uh, we're leading more into roadmaps that really take into consideration what to do now, but also like being very clear that you can have a North Star, but you can have a very, like everything that says that roadmap can actually change tomorrow because you need to account for that. So roadmaps that are a bit more flexible around the way, but I have a really good idea of where do you want to go. And if things changes, allow you to change that goal as well. Uh, activation models, which are something that, that allow you to identify which are the disciplines that you need in order to bring the experience to life. Because we have seen many, many times that we can come in with an amazing design solution that we think are going to solve uh, user pain points, we have research, uh, it makes sense, it has an amazing branded um, direction, and then at the end, the, all the back end, all the data cannot support and enable that. Like you cannot have personalization because something is happening in the back. So getting more connected to all the elements that integrate and actually help us deliver an experience is, is something that, that can be done if we actually identify what are going to be the task that every single um, discipline needs to do in order to create an activation uh, model that can become a roadmap for the company uh, and for ourselves to follow. Um, another point which is really important to me uh, actually is embracing true data-driven design because I think this has been a buzzword since like seven years ago <laughs> when we said like we are data-driven, we make decisions and the reality is like data-driven was just like looking at one dashboard, uh, which makes sense, is what we had. But I think the moment that we're now when you can really start analyzing very heavy data sets where you can actually have the computational power to start creating and finding patterns, having accesses to other type of data sets that you normally wouldn't have before. I think that is, is going to just really help us make through data-driven design decisions that are actually real time. Because something else that used to happen in the past is that most of the data that we used to get was really old data. And the reality is with this ever-changing landscape, if you're activating open data even from one year ago, probably the behavior is completely different now. So I'm really excited for this point. Actually, uh, I have never been so much connected to data people. Like I think data analysts are my new best friends. Now I can understand them a bit more. Uh, same thing with the SEO teams. Probably for some of you is not such a big difference, but I will say that for us as design team, it took us a while to understand that we should be best friends with that, those guys <laughs> and those ladies who are really, really smart. So 
Um, SEO audits, understand the NCO, SEO uh, insights before actually starting to move anything into the architecture of the products that we're working on. Um, getting insights from real uh, real time dashboard, understanding that now we have even more spaces and touch points that we can use to gather that data. Like imagine that now with AI, I al I'm also seeing and hearing about tooling that allow you to start doing uh, social listenings at the same time that you are gathering like cultural uh, topics and being able to use that data to actually create content for the websites and for the apps that you're working on. I think that that is just going to re really revolutionize uh, the way that we actually use data to improve the experience of the products that we work with. Um, something that is actually not that new, but like using predictive models in order to create the scenarios, like the way that um, this be is being used in much more important, <laughs> I will say spaces like medicine and, and, and other areas. But I think in design, I really like the way that is speculative design become way more data driven where we can find and identify different scenarios so we can make design decisions even before we actually start designing. Uh, testing some hypotheses even before, like the time uh, that is going to reduce, I think is going to be really amazing. And the, the way that is going to help us um, ease some of the, the, the risk, some of the anxiety uh, that comes with uh, investing a lot of your time into something that you feel you have all the backup in the world and then that can change drastically. This is really how we, we can uh, play against uh, that uh, uncertainty to an extent. This is one that I also really like and I personally love prototyping. It's something that I enjoy uh, to do a lot. Engaging into iterative prototyping is something that I do believe that as well is like a big of a mindset for design. I do believe that we tend to go into design as I want to do the most perfect, more crafted uh, thing at once at the beginning, where probably we need to be a bit more comfortable with knowing that probably our first design are going to be just frameworks. <laughs> and we're actually just doing this like very great testing if navigation feels right, if kind of, you know, like the buttons feels that we can actually integrate our architecture there. Uh, making companies and, and, and business owners also more comfortable of starting small, starting less crafty probably to go directly into craft real fast. Uh, moving from that into actual prototypes where we can test micro interactions, where we can test the communication that we're putting in each of our pages. That example over there is uh, one project that we did for a company that was uh, is trying, because actually this went live, um, was trying to merge a loyalty program with a digital wallet. And we were like, oh my God, this is going to create an app that is going to be so complicated to use. So we were like trying a couple of things. We were trying to see how we can integrate elements uh, how we can convey different messages and test those with users and really it started from a framework type of prototyping into something a bit more more fi uh, final and then it has been keep evolving uh, with the time, learning from, from the, the insights that we get. Uh, another one that is something that I feel is getting more traction is um, this AI design sprints where what we do is try to understand an industry and one of our clients and what are their main pain points and we try to see how AI can actually uh, allow us to, to solve them. Wh how AI can be integrated within those products. So we're using products that we're already working on that no one has asked us to integrate AI with, <laughs> but we're, we're making ourselves these questions and we're prototyping and presenting these to clients. And actually there, this, this has been really interesting because we used to have roadmaps that said that we were going to go from point A to point B in X amount of time. But if we, you actually integrate and start researching some let's say uh, more new models and a couple of, of uh, I don't know, like new APIs that are being created and you start testing that, you actually can go faster to the, to the, 
to the um, North Star that I said that we were putting for that client. So what I'm putting there is a very small, um, simple, rough prototype that we were doing with uh, Bini, one of the uh, creative directors, design directors in the company. We were playing around what happened <laughs> when you, uh, this, is, this is for a, um, a restaurant chain in, in, in the US, and we were thinking, you are, if you're going to get into the website of a fast food restaurant, you're craving something, right? So what does it mean <laughs> to actually deliver and help you find what you crave? And that was the main question. That was like, how do we solve for that? We start thinking around what could be the potential uh, implementations that we could do in order to solve that question. And what we started to, to plan around was an interface that looks pretty like normal, but in fact is really powered by, by AI in order to understand the user from a not like regular segmentation perspective, but more like thinking of how can we identify craving? What are the, the interactions? What are the elements that we need to know from this person in order to, enter, to know what they crave? What the time of the day is it? Is it Sunday? Uh, does this person likes the NFL? Uh, do you know if this some like if you start correlating culture, weather, and some other points, you can start finding really interesting uh, creative insights that we can pull into the interface and start uh, creating something that feels way more uh, personalized for you. So this is these are very small sprints that we do in order to prototype ideas, start testing them, and then see what happened, and if we continue uh, integrating those. Uh, so this one was a, an interesting one for me. Um, another point that is quite, uh, not just super, well, super important, is prioritizing ethical design. As the digital landscape keeps uh, evolving, we need to prioritize ethics, and the reason why I say that is because even though there are way more policies in place, also we are uh, navigating the unknown. And when we're navigating the unknown, there's way less protection. So we um, encourage you <laughs> and encourage our own designers to think like every time that we have a great idea, to think what could be the implications of that idea. The same thing that I feel every founder <laughs> should be th making this, this um, idea, making these questions. What of what we're doing, uh, and if any of the ideas that we have are impacting data privacy, are impacting probably uh, people that could be vulnerable, are not including everyone, uh, not everyone can access or, or have or being part of the experience. This is something that I, I feel is, is just have to be centered. The reality is that, uh, of course, these are very broad, not necessarily UI examples, but there has been companies, companies that has disrupt markets, and that is, is interesting because it's going to have a real repercussion as well on, on the design of the products that, that we use. One example that I really like is, I don't know if there's any gamers in the room, but The Last of Us is actually a design that I took a lot as a reference when I'm designing websites and apps, which is you know like uh, something that probably does, doesn't really probably be, is the best reference, or you don't take gaming as references, but what those guys are doing or did for uh, The Last of Us in terms of accessibility is just insane. So taking some of the elements that already exist and just applying that into our experiences is something that is going to help us be more, uh, let's say, sustainable uh, for the future. Um, and yeah, I think like just designing beyond compliance is a message that I want to, uh, have and leave you guys with. Another point that is um, that I want to have here is about this trend. I don't want to call it trend because it's, it's more than that, but planet-centric design where we start asking ourselves, and there's an actually really cool toolkit uh, that if you just Google planet-centric design toolkit, probably this is the first thing that you're going to get. But it just talks about how can you integrate uh, a mindset of not only designing for people, but also defining, designing uh, in a more uh, better relationship with the, with the planet uh, in itself. And it's a lot about sustainability in design. It's a lot more around understanding 
the carbon footprint of, of digital design, and I think that's, that's something that, that is, is quite, quite, quite important. Moving forward, um, and this is, again, one that is connected a lot with AI and all the things that you're going to see uh, probably in, in, in this, or you have seen in these two days, is engaging with this continuous learning and practice. Uh, and this is more like a culture that I feel we need to create uh, within our design teams or as a design uh, itself. Every day there's a new tool for AI, <laughs> every day. Like you always feel that you're behind, uh, or I don't know if you feel the same, but I feel that. Like every day there's something new. It's like I don't have the time to really like just explore every single tool out, uh, out there. But the reality is that if we change a bit that, that mindset and say, I'm doing this task as a designer, I'm doing research, is there any tool around that could help me or can, could improve, could speed up my, my research process, you probably will find an answer. And if your day-to-day, -day, you find the space to start implementing uh, or just exploring uh, those ideas, comparing to the way that you will normally do things, see how the tool actually, what is the output that you get from that, that is, an engage, that is engaging into a continuous learning, like not feeling that you are doing it because you need to start like studying every day, but embedding that into your day-to-day, -day, into your design process. Uh, something that is happening uh, as we speak, actually, um, is that we have people within Media Monk that are just uh, asking questions, like <laughs> literally that, like how can we integrate uh, UX in, uh, sorry, integrate UI into our UX practice? What are the things that, for example, up there, uh, Victoria, uh, was actually working into how to create uh, mood boards using AI in order to get some ideas, initial ideas, and from there it starts sparking and probably just defining what the design direction is. Of course, she's a curator, but she's using AI in order to start creating some initial uh, test of where the experience could, could go. And I really like the potential of that. I, I think that uh, now we're also experimenting with this uh, tools that allow you to create compositions real fast. And we were like, this is just spinning our process so much. Um, I have a lot of faith, <laughs> I will say, into uh, how this is going to help us as well as uh, speed up uh, research processes, testing processes. And the reason is that I hear more and more that we don't have time to test. Or if we're going to test, we need to do it like in the middle of the design, but it doesn't have to impact in any way the launch of our product. And we're like, well, if we find ways to have faster testing uh, tools, of course, being in check of not having any bias and definitely not asking chat GPT, like, does my consumers are going to, you know, like being able to use this or that because I don't know what is inside. I don't know who's the people that are going to, uh, I mean, it's not the people are going to be asked, right? So using very smartly AI in order to speed up some processes like the question guides. Now there's even uh, examples of, uh, they call like synthetic um, subject, uh, uh, yeah, like synthetic research basically where they are training, there's people that are training models with uh, actual, uh, research and human behavior that is going to allow us to create some uh, fast way to go and test and uh, ideas real fast. And I was like, as a UX, I'm in the middle of that. Do I do want to talk with a human and understand that this is the human behavior, but probably that, that is something that I will completely tr want to try because it is the, I understand what is the baseline of it. I understand that there's going to be actual humans behind that are going to be feeding up these algorithms. So I have a bit more trust of using that in order to use or test some of my designs. So this is, I, I feel it's just taking a bit this, this uh, mentality of, no, I will not do that, or this is just overwhelming. Someone who is an AI expert is going to figure it out, and then I'm going to jump into a TV, uh, into a, um, uh, you know, like a video that is going to explain that to me or going to jump into a Medium article that is going to explain that to me. I think we need to be more conscious of that this is not going to go anywhere. Uh, it's not going to get away, definitely. And we need to just bring it on, like 
continuous learning all day. Um, and uh, something else uh, as a seventh point is foster collaboration to drive innovation. As I said at the beginning, I think this has been the year at least where I have uh, connected way more with multiple different disciplines. They are becoming part, they have become part of the team in reality. Data analyst, SEO uh, strategies, content strategies, I mean, copywriters, of course, since, since before, definitely developers, like, but not only that, even the clients, like we are all living in this same world of, of changes, like be, having the client, having a seat at the table in your design process, having these all disciplines, being able and giving them the space to talk about design, to think about design is something that for some designers, it's really a shift because we're really protective of our design. We're really protective of our disciplines and we don't allow other disciplines to come in and participate. So the only way that I see in, uh, or the only way that I also have researched that in these uncertain times, collaboration is the only way forward. So we're talking about developers, we're talking about marketeers, we're talking about the people that are in the supply chain process, you know, like people that do operations that normally are never asked about what do they think or if the actual product is going to be, uh, be able to be shipped in time, uh, to put an example. So in order to really create this collaborated uh, innovative solutions, we need to really look outside design. And I think that's uh, quite important. Eight, uh, part, uh, anticipate and plan for change. This is, I don't know if there's uh, project managers or uh, product, um, man yeah, product managers in the room, but I see more and more that in the past, we used to have uh, design, uh, you know, like we used to design these backlogs or we used to design these design, proce uh, design processes and how we were going to organize the sprints. And there were always these edge cases that was basically like, if we get the time, we're going to put it, put it all. Or there was client putting in more urgent requests. So what you were supposed to do, just like you never get to that because you were always doing the more urgent thing. And the reality is that if you know there is going to be changes, don't create a plan that is so structured to not enable those changes. And this is something that we have talked a lot with the production teams, with the project management teams, is how do we do that? How do we create um, strong planning that allows us to have those like real-time discussions and prioritizations with the client whenever we need to launch something fast? So there's a, a, a couple of interesting, um, I'm definitely not the best person to talk about project management, but I will say that we have found really good like middle points where we can manage design operations in a way that really enable us to start moving pieces around without like breaking a perfectly <laughs> structured uh, plan in order to get us uh, live. Another uh, way to anticipate, anticipate and plan for change is to create design that is actually flexible. I know this uh, with the design system uh, rising, this is something that is more common in the companies, but you have no idea how many companies I have worked with where the designs are in a file somewhere in someone's computer, and then you have 30 teams that are working in different things, nothing really, like there's no efficiencies, there's no uh, unification in any way, there's no consistency, but the reality is when, when you want to move fast, that, that really drag you out, that really drag you away. So creating the same systems that speed your process but doesn't make you, um, that give you the room to actually find creative solutions because you don't have to be so worried about the technical aspect because the technical aspect is done already. You have the building blocks. You can now play with those building blocks. You can completely uh, uh, trash the building blocks if you want, but you have a baseline. You have something to work with. So this is was done by a really good friend of mine that is actually in the audience somewhere, um, Liva and her team. Uh, for one of our clients, uh, the team was working in a way to 
being able to um, scale up the, the creation of websites because they were doing websites around the, around the world all the time. And they were like, we're just doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Like, why are we starting from some scratch every time? So they create a very solid design system that then was also took by media monks and was being used to create more other, other uh, websites, internal websites even, in a very fast way. And I think it's just in very interesting that whenever you are in a scenario of constraint and, and you know, you're pushed a bit into the corner, like these type of solutions can come up. And finally, because I know my time is up, but <laughs> I want you guys to really take this one uh, with you now that you go here. It's just keep it human with all the AI that is happening. Keep it human because in times of uncertainty, understanding is more crucial. Be empathetic uh, because we're all living in the same world. The businesses that you're working with or you're working for are also facing challenges. You are facing challenges as a designer. Your mental health is a struggle. Our own mental health is a struggle. Uh, the users out there are having a lot to think about, and we are designing in that space. So be empathetic, uh, be compassionate, be kind. And with that, I will say uh, thank you. This is a quick summary if you want to.